Hi, it's Dr. Centeno, and uh, welcome to You've Got the Power. Today, we're going to talk about an important topic, which is understanding the, the big differences between uh, the types of posterior upper cervical injections. Uh, and this actually uh, came up this week because uh, I had a patient who uh, I thought understood all of this, but ended up uh, going to a, a chiropractic office to get a very low level neck injection uh, and then was having some issues and wanted me to troubleshoot. And I, I just had to say, hey, listen, you know, the type of procedure you had is not up to our standard. So I don't know what happened uh, there, but I can tell you what our standards are for these procedures. And so there's still this disconnect between what people understand uh, a posterior cervical injection is and what it really is when we're talking about the upper neck uh, and the upper cervical spine. So I'd like to go over that today. Uh, and as usual, I'll start with a video that goes through uh, this topic and we'll do a small lecture. And then we're gonna open it up to questions uh, Questions can be about this topic. They can be about any topic. Doesn't really matter. Uh, so I'll get the ball rolling here. Uh, let me go ahead and, and share my screen. And Okay, so understanding the vast differences between the types of posterior upper cervical injections. So there are wildly different levels of neck injections from the back or posterior that are out there being done. Uh, and, and the most simple type that's out there and that probably the most common would be a blind uh, basic ligament injection. Usually this is prolotherapy. And that's where the doctor just takes a needle and tries to hit the back of the uh, neck where the ligaments uh, live. And then we've got uh, a basic injection where there's some guidance used. Uh, so we have a clinic in Florida that does this. Uh, they do basic ligament prolotherapy but then they'll use x-ray to make sure they're placing the needles in the right bony spots. And I'll talk to you about that uh, in just a little bit in more detail. And then we've got the next level up. And you know these two levels are pretty basic. I could teach someone to do this in a few days. Uh, a weekend course would be fine and they'd be safe and good to go. But then we jump up and there's a major leap into this next category. And that is where you're injecting the ligaments and then you're doing what's called contrast confirmed facet joint injections in the lower neck. So that's anything kind of C2, 3 and below. And that's not something you can teach someone in days. That requires usually a fellowship uh, training or some other intensive type of training. And they might take a full year to two years to really get good at that type of procedure of placing stuff exactly into those small little finger sized joints that live in the neck. And then again, we have another huge leap here. Uh, and this is based on the fact uh, not only uh, of training, but an experience. And that is injecting all that other stuff plus getting into the upper neck joints, which requires something called uh, digital subtraction and geography. And so let's say in the US, we have about 10,000 providers who are adequately trained to do this. And let's say we have another 10,000 providers or so who took a weekend course on how to do that. Um, but the problem is, if we look for providers who have a lot of experience in doing this, this one down here, um, we're somewhere between 50 and 100 US providers who have a lot of experience in injecting these upper neck joints. So you can see that, you know, the funnel, if you will, 
is wide up top, and then it gets uh, obviously smaller as you go down a bit, and then gets extremely tiny as you get into those providers that can do upper cervical facet injections who have digital subtraction. So let's go through each one of these because I want patients to understand this. I've talked a little bit about this before, but uh, it continues to come up. So I want to make sure I can point someone to this video and say, hey, watch that video and, and then we'll, we'll discuss this. So the basic ligament injections, whether you have guidance or not, uh, is basically just touching down on these bony spots uh, that I'm putting the X's by, and that's on the lamina. Uh, and you can do this blind. It's really kind of inappropriate in 2022 to do this blind. Uh, at least it requires some guidance now to make sure you're not sticking the, sticking the needle into the spinal cord. Um, but it used to be done blind, shouldn't really be done blind in, in 2022. Uh, and you also inject this, these nuchal ligament areas uh, in here, the supraspinous interspinous ligaments that are kind of in between and just outside of the spinous processes. So this is really just a neck ligament on the right and kind of a, a with a muscles come in uh, injection on the left. Now, there are all of these facet joints, right? There's one in here, and there's there and there, and you can pick them out uh, on this one, too. And getting into those facet joints can't be done using this technique uh, other than through blind luck. Uh, meaning there's no way really to get into these joints without uh, using a fluoroscope to inject contrast. But some of the providers that do this kind of injection will kind of mess with the language a little bit. They'll tell patients, uh, and this is a, a clinic in Florida that does this a lot, that the patient is getting a facet joint injection, but they're not. There's no uh, attempt to meet the definition of what physicians would consider a facet joint injection. So that's not happening with this type of procedure at all. Even though some of the doctors may claim that they're doing that, that's not being done. And again, this basic ligament injection, you could teach someone to do this. I could teach them in a weekend course, they'd be safe. They wouldn't have a lot of experience obviously in doing it, but they'd be safe and that's how long it takes to learn this because it's a very, very simple technique. Now we get to the next level where a lot more training is required. And this is where you're, you're using a needle to get into the facet joint, but then you're injecting radiographic contrast to make sure you're in that joint and nowhere else. And then you're injecting whatever it is you're injecting. Uh, might be PRP, for example, into a facet joint. Now, this is not easy to learn. We have a fellowship program uh, at my clinic. We've had that for a decade now. We take one or two fellows a year. These are young doctors who need to learn these things. And I can tell you that even though our fellows have done a little a bit, bit of this in their residency, um, it takes them a good solid year to master this so that they feel like they're very comfortable with it. And a lot of that has to do with the differences in anatomy and the additional substantial time it takes to make sure you're in that little joint. Uh, because sometimes you're hitting a target that's no bigger than, bigger than a millimeter or two. Um, and in a heavy patient, you might be using a four or five inch needle to hit a two millimeter target that's five inches deep or four inches deep. So very hard to learn to do, uh, but we have providers in this country that can do this. Most of them regrettably inject steroids, which is bad for the patient, but some of those providers can inject PRP into these joints. And the problem is sometimes there's not good crossover between these providers and the ones that do ligament injections. And again, you know, with this, where you're injecting ligaments plus getting into those joints and documenting that, we're talking about a solid year 
in general for someone to get really good at doing this and, and to say they are accomplished enough where they can get into those joints easily and quickly and uh, safely in 99.99% of the patients. And now we go to where there's really rarefied air. We're now talking about maybe 100 US providers who have done these procedures in the upper cervical spine, uh, more than a dozen or two dozen times. And doctors are no different than anybody else. If you do something uh, a dozen times, you're bad at it. If you do something a hundred times, you're okay at it. If you do something a thousand times, you start to get to mastery. So we just don't have uh, US healthcare providers. And this, you, the US would be by far more advanced in this stuff than any other country on earth right now. Um, and I can tell you, we don't have a hundred US providers that have done this anywhere near a thousand times. Um, in fact, we probably only have uh, 10, <clears throat> five US providers who have injected these joints a thousand times. So what makes these joints so difficult? Let's talk a little bit about that here. So we got the skull. This is also called C0. This would be C1 and this would be C2. So skull called C0, C1, and C2. Uh, down here, C3. So we're talking about the C0, C1 joint, and we're talking about the C1, C2 joint. And this is, again, using radiographic contrast to make sure you're in there. That's the stuff that you inject that you can see on x-ray to make sure you're in this joint. One of the problems with this with injecting these joints is the vertebral artery runs up here and then it kind of snakes around and then comes back in this direction and then eventually goes to the frame and magnum and goes into the skull. And, and then also there are upper cervical ligaments that just aren't done out there that are important. And that's these atlanto-occipital ligaments here. And again, these are harder to do because the vertebral artery runs right through there. So you're not very far from that vertebral artery when you're injecting this ligament. And you would need something like digital subtraction angiography, which we'll talk about, to make sure you're not in that artery. Because if you inject that artery, that artery supplies blood to the back of the brain. And if you inject the wrong stuff into that artery, then that's a bad day for everybody, um, mostly the patient. Uh, but also the doctor too. So uh, this probably looks like total mishmash to you. And frankly, this would look like total mishmash to 99.9% uh, of all the interventional spine doctors who routinely inject other joints would look at this image and say, I have no idea what it is you're trying to show me here. Now, since I do this all day, every day, I can make some sense of it for you here. So this is uh, C1, transverse process of C1 coming down here. This is uh, C2. So this is the C1, C2 joint. And then this is the occiput here. And so this is C0. This is C1. So we have the C zero C1 joint and we have the C1 C2 joint. Again, if I throw, show this picture to a thousand physicians who have done the years of training to know how to inject the lower neck facet joints, uh, I'll probably get one that will understand what it is they're looking at here. Obviously, if you don't understand the picture, you can't inject it. And then we have radiographic contrast here uh, that's actually in this uh, C0, C1 joint that's demonstrating that the needle is in that joint and nowhere else. And the place you don't want it is on the next slide. So here's an MRI from an actual patient this week. And I thought it was really nice because we got a nice cut here. Um, now, so this is C0, this is C1, and this is C2. That guy right there 
is where you really, really, really don't want to inject. Uh, because again, that vertebral artery supplies blood to the back of the brain. And if you were to inject bone marrow concentrate, PRP, or God forbid, prolotherapy solution in there, you may have a dead patient on your hand or at least one with a posterior circulation stroke. Uh, so that's the reason why this area requires extensive experience. So the injection route that actually I developed and published on, uh, the previous one was kind of crazy. It used to come in like this, trying to get into that joint. The problem is you weren't all that far from the vertebral artery. And sometimes you would get into the vertebral artery by using that approach. But that's the approach that's taught in courses. And it's the reason why a lot of doctors just don't want to deal with this. Um, so I invented another approach that comes in this way uh, into that joint well above the vertebral artery so that you're farther away from that. Now, that's a little harder to do technically because what you see on the x-rays, you see the bottom part of the joint. You don't see this entry here. So you've got to do some magic with the x-ray to make sure that you can aim for the entry and not where the joint appears. And this is an example of digital subtraction and geography. I'll see if I can switch this here. So digital subtraction and geography just means that we subtracted out all the other stuff through a computer algorithm. And all we're seeing is what's being injected. And the good news is this digital subtraction and geography loop shows that the needle's in the right place and that the dark stuff is uh, going into the joint and not the vertebral artery. Now it's safe to inject. Uh, and, but if I didn't have this, the, the, the dark stuff or the contrast can go so quickly into the artery that you can miss it and you can falsely believe you're not in the artery. So that's why it's good to have this DSA. The problem is this DSA is expensive and it's not on your routine pain management uh, fluoroscopy machine uh, because it's expensive. It's only usually on machines that are used for cardio or for interventional cardiology. So it's a special order that your pain management doctor is unlikely to have on the machine. Um, hence, they shouldn't be doing this type of work without the ability to make sure that they're not in that vertebral artery. Again, injected the vertebral artery equals bad day for everybody. And again, we're talking about massive experience required to do this kind of procedure uh, safely. So not only should you have been doing these types of injections for many years, but you have to do it a lot to get that repetition to say that you have expertise in doing this. And what do I mean by a lot? Um, you know, you gotta be doing these procedures uh, five times a week, at least uh, 20 times a month. Uh, and as you can see, if you do that, then maybe you can get 250 of these procedures in in a, in a year. Uh, but it's gonna take you four years to get to a thousand. Um, and the average interventional spine doctor, not the guys doing prolo, like I talked about, but the average interventional spine doctor has been doing, uh, it probably does one or two of these a year. Uh, as you might imagine, anything that you do once or twice a year, let's say you, know, you wanna learn to play the guitar, but you only do it once or twice a year, you're never really going to get good enough for anyone to say, hey, you're a really great guitar player. So in summary, be very cautious about choosing a clinic to inject your upper neck. Uh, obviously, going to a chiropractic clinic to get your upper neck injected is a little bit like getting open heart surgery at a chiropractic clinic. It's not the right spot. Uh, and most clinics that do this uh, offer those simple ligament injections that we talked about. 
um, they're not doing facet injections. They're not getting into what are possibly damaged joints in the upper neck. Now, there are some clinics with more training that can get into the lower neck facets, and they're trained to do that, and that's wonderful. Um, but when it comes to C0, C1, and C1, C2, um, we're really talking about a handful of clinics around the world that do enough of these procedures to, to actually say that they have expertise in doing that. And they've got to have a cardio uh, interventional cardiology package called digital subtraction angiography on that machine to do those injections safely. And if we look at uh, pain management clinics, again, probably only 1% or even hospital surgery centers where pain management injections are done, only about 1% have digital subtraction angiography available for use by that interventional spine physician. Uh, so I'm going to uh, wrap that up now and I'll uh, take off the share and then we can uh, hopefully get to some questions. Discard those. Uh, okay, so questions. Uh, let me go to uh, questions and comments here. Connor, uh, hi, my skull feels like my chin is stuck to my neck in the chin tuck position that is that is that most likely something in the posterior side to blame. Connor, I guess the big question there would be, does it feel like it's stuck there permanently? Like, are you down like this and you can't lift your head up? And if you do, it wants to go back down? Because if so, that might be more of a dystonia uh, than something like CCI, although CCI can cause dystonia. So I need to know a little bit more information to, uh, to answer that one. Uh, Regenix, uh, Harry Winston, in your experience with the percentage of suspected CCI patients without access to DMX who improve with posterior injections? Uh, that's a good question. All I can say is that when we qualify someone with CCI, whether that's on a static MRI or a flexion extension MRI or a DMX, because we can get there all three ways, uh, most likely DMX, less likely on the other two, then uh, about one in five of those patients uh, isn't needing to move on to PICL and will drop out at that level of just doing the posterior injections. Uh, it's been advanced by Carmen. Uh, where can we get posterior injections? Are they available in New York City? Um, uh, Carmen, when it comes to uh, simple ligament injections, those are available. When it comes to uh, high upper cervical facet injections, there is not a provider in New York City with enough experience to do those, regrettably. Uh, so it depends on what it is we're talking about, but that's what this was about. Uh, so uh, you may want to ask that again now that you've seen the video and, and hopefully have some understanding of the vast differences between these types of injections. Uh, Phil, head upright uh, MRI at uh, Medserena measurements include flexion normal and x-ray and side flexion revealed over probably overhang of C1 over C2 by three. Does this mean the other transverse issue? Yeah, so Phil, if you had three uh, millimeters of overhang, then that would put you in the category of CCI and there'd be about a one in five chance that the posterior injections would be helpful and you wouldn't need a PICL at about a four in five or an 80% chance that PICL is the next uh, move there. Uh, hello, Dr. Centeno. Have you seen patients clicking and popping go away after posterior PRP stem cell injections? Several folks mentioned still getting the clicking and popping even though muscles are relaxed and pain is reduced. Yeah, Shanze, so there's two reasons that happens. One is that there's still instability. The other is uh, actually a better sign that something was incredibly unstable and it wasn't uh, causing any noise and now is tighter. So you're getting more noise from that. Uh, so those are the two things we commonly see. Phil, of the 20% of patients that only need posterior PRP injections, not PICL, of those, how many only required one PRP injection session to get well? Yeah, very few, Phil. I would say that we're talking about um, 
a large percentage of those patients needing more injections than one, usually uh, two to three, somewhere in, in that range. Uh, Phil, if the cartilage in the facet joint was damaged, will the PRP heal it? You know, Phil, it really depends on the amount of damage. Uh, if it's a small uh, fissure in the cartilage and we've got a relatively young, healthy patient, then I think it's, it's possible that PRP could heal it. Uh, if we've got, you know, no cartilage or extensive damage in the cartilage, it's unlikely that the PRP will heal that, uh, although it may make it feel an awful lot better. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you for a good experience once again. Posted your other injections last week. Wake out, my headaches abated two days after hydro. Um, as of today, headache is flared up again with higher dissection. Is there an expected timeline when they finally calm down again? Yeah, Elizabeth, I think as we talked about uh, in the clinic, and I don't want to get into your confidential health information, so maybe just reach out to me directly on that one because uh, I'm concerned that I'm broaching that sort of doctor-patient confidentiality thing. I do have some recommendations there, though. Uh, Jay, uh, a little over one week post past PICL hydro. So far doing well. I have a general idea of what to expect as far as recovery period of PICL. I was curious if hydro had a similar recovery or maybe start to link potential results. You know, Jay, uh, hydro dissections like that usually give sooner results than PICL. So that might start helping in the time frame of two to three weeks, whereas PICL more like uh, two to three months. Uh, so hopefully that helps there. Shanze, uh, Doctor, would something tighter click? Uh, yeah, so, so Shanze, the best way to think about that would be um, if you've got a joint that's extremely unstable and it's moving around, there's not a lot of noise associated with that. But once things get a little bit tighter, you tend to get more clicks and pops. And then eventually, once they're completely tightened down, that goes away. Uh, now, it's also possible that it's not what's causing it at all, but uh, we certainly see that in a lot of prolo patients where we're treating their joints, where initially the joint is super sloppy, it, you know, it doesn't make much noise other than it just feels unstable. Then we tighten down the ligaments and they start to get some noise, and then eventually that noise goes away. Um, Shanze, can injections help tighten enough to get rid of crookedness, which may still be experienced post injection, even though they are feeling better. Yeah, Shanza, I would need to know a lot more to answer about your personal clinical situation to answer that one. Uh, Elvis, hi, every time pain level goes up last year, I taste iron rust metallic in my mouth and knows why have AAI, CCI, read about CFS leak or CSF leak, is this dangerous? Um, I don't know why you would taste uh, different things uh, in your mouth and nose. Now, there could be some irritation of critical nerves like uh, uh, the second uh, branch or V2 of cranial nerve five, but that wouldn't be a common thing. Uh, is it possible that there's a CSF leak? It's possible. Uh, CSF leaks are not dangerous, they, but they can cause a lot of pain and wreak, and wreak a lot of havoc. So that's something you might need to get worked up. Uh, Phil, would near-infrared light uh, therapy pad to the neck following posterior, post posterior PRP help healing? Yeah, you know, Phil, I think that uh, that's the kind of thing that would help. I would say if you use something like that, be a little careful because sometimes it can stoke a little too much inflammation, but in general, those types of things help. Sean's a head differential between Estonia and cervical instability. Would imaging be enough for physical exam in Colorado? Uh, yeah, Sean's a usually upper cervical instability causes dystonia. Um, so I don't know that there's a need to differentiate between those two. In fact, uh, having just done some Research on that this week, you know, the prevailing theory about why dystonia is there is now upper cervical instability. Um, so they're, they're one, they're kind of hand in glove, if you will. Uh, uh, I don't know if I can say that name, uh, Kel Kelakini, maybe. 
High direction tendo, can CCI cause tinnitus? Uh, CCI can cause tinnitus. We have a lot of CCI patients with tinnitus. It would be what I would call a second tier symptom. So the first tier symptoms are headache, dizziness. The second tier symptoms uh, would include tinnitus. Uh, all I mean by second tier is that the most commonly reported things are headache and dizziness or vertigo or imbalance. And then, uh, then a little bit less common, but still very frequent is tinnitus. Uh, Cian, are we going to see umbilical cord stem cells at your clinic soon? I'm hoping I heard the FDA is going to approve it or in the U.S. in the next 24 months. I don't think there's going to be any approval in uh, umbilical cord stem cells in the next 24 months. So, uh, no, uh, I think that's probably a pipe dream. I don't think that's going to happen. How long would it be before an umbilical cord stem cell product got approved for musculoskeletal use? I think we're at least five years out from that right now. Uh, simply because we don't have a ton of research there to point to, to say that that's, that would be a good idea in most patients. Um, so uh, we may see something like that, but I don't think it's going to be the next 24 months. And if you're reading uh, uh, Tony Robbins' book, you may want to read my blog on Tony Robbins' book. Um, I don't think, uh, in my uh, opinion, there's much fact in the book. Uh, so you may want to read that, but no, I don't think 24 months is anything close to reasonable for an approval of umbilical cord stem cells here in the U.S. Uh, so not going to happen in that time frame. Could happen in five years. Uh, you never know. Uh, now, I would have said five years ago that we'd have an autologous bone marrow uh, mesenchymal stem cell approved by 2022. But here we are, and we're at least probably two years away from that. So... You know, it's so hard to judge uh, with the FDA, but 24 months, if you're reading Tony Robbins' book, uh, that is not accurate based on my opinion. Other questions, guys, I can answer? I'll give it just a couple more minutes here. Hey, Ricardo. Okay, guys. Uh, so I'll start winding this up. Uh, so uh, CN, uh, CN or Cayenne, does uh, Lyme disease affect the outcome of PICL? You know, we haven't seen any overlap there, but I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing when we talk about Lyme disease. Um, there's a, a Lyme disease diagnosis that comes from a, uh, an infectious disease specialist in medicine. So that's someone who has gone through an internal medicine residency and spent usually three or four years going through an infectious disease uh, fellowship. And then uh, we have uh, what I would call the functional medicine Lyme disease diagnosis. So when I talk about Lyme disease, I'm talking about a medical specialist who spent, you know, four years in college, four years in medical school, three years of residency, and four years of fellowship, who has made that diagnosis. If we're talking about a functional medicine diagnosis, then I generally don't recognize those for Lyme disease. Um, so, so far, we have not seen uh, any differences there. But again, most of our patients aren't coming in with an infectious disease specialist diagnosed Lyme disease. They're coming in with a, with a functional medicine diagnosis of Lyme disease, and that would be a hard one here. Um, uh, Braun, how do you respond to the claim that MSCs derived from orange jelly have significantly lower immunogenicity, immunogenicity than the ones derived from other sources like bone marrow and fat, and therefore stable, suitable for allergenic use? Yeah, Braun, I don't think the research supports that at all right now. In fact, I think the research supports the opposite. Um, I've read, I think I've already blogged on some of the research uh, done at a, out of uh, Texas A&M on the concept that uh, there is really no such thing as an immune privileged stem cell. Uh, that concept was sort of 10 years ago. And one of the reasons why we're probably seeing hit and miss results in some of these FDA trials 
is because uh, we're, we're probably going to have to type these cells or HLA type these cells if we want them not to get taken out by the host's immune system. Uh, so there's some really nice work at a Texas A&M and at least three or four other papers that show that uh, umbilical cord cells or any allogeneic cells go ahead and substantially rev up the immune system of the host. Uh, as far as using bone marrow fat from the same person, obviously there's no uh, immunogenicity there at all. Um, so I would say you're, you're talking to the salespeople and not reading the literature if that's what you believe. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, just to answer the second part of your question, uh, there is no viability to any of the commercially available, quote, umbilical cord products um, in the U.S. In fact, we published a paper on that. So let's go to that paper. Uh, these guys know I love sharing stuff online. So let's go to, let's pull up PubMed and share that. That looks like it. Okay, so this is the U.S. National Library of Medicine here. Uh, let's pull up our paper. So we actually tested uh, 2020 during the pandemic. And this was published in October of 2021, American Journal of Sports Medicine. We tested five products that claimed to show or claimed to have viable uh, uh, mesenchymal stem cells in them that were umbilical derived. Uh, four of those came from Morton's Jelly and none of them had any viable and functional mesenchymal stem cells at all. Uh, in fact, when you compared elderly bone marrow to those products, elderly bone marrow had lots of mesenchymal stem cells. All of these products were, were dead, uh, so or at least dead on arrival. So uh, so anyway, that's, that's that. Let me move on because uh, I've got other folks asking questions. Phil, my clival vertebral angle, or maybe clival axial angle, I think. Uh, Chamberlain's line, grab oaks, and Bayesian uh, uh, BDI are all normal, including flexion. But my C2 overhangs C1, three, or C1 overhangs C2, the other way around, uh, three millimeters. Is that purely due to capsular ligament issue? Yeah, so uh, Phil, we wouldn't expect. Uh, any of those things you mentioned, like uh, uh, clavoaxial angle called CXA, Chamberlain's, Chamberlain's lines, grab oaks, or a BDI to be abnormal in flexion if there's an ALAR ligament issue. Um, the C1-C2 capsule is not a major stabilizer of C1-C2. Uh, those major stabilizers would be the transverse band of the cruciate ligament, otherwise known as the transverse ligament and the ALAR ligaments that come up from the dens. Uh, so likely what you're dealing with there is an ALAR ligament injury, not a capsular C1-C2 injury, because the capsule at C1-C2 in particular is not a great stabilizer because think about it, C1-C2 gives you 50% of your total rotation at that one joint. The other 50% comes from all the other joints in little bits. So any joint that has that lacks of a capsule to allow that kind of motion is not going to be a good stabilizer when it comes to the capsule. Uh, so that's the that's the issue there. Uh, Connor, uh, sorry, did you answer my question? I'm not sure. I thought I did, Connor, uh, but maybe ask it again. Uh, you know, I have heard uh, that sometimes these things jump in here uh, a little bit late. In fact, I'm just seeing some late questions. So I'm gonna try, meaning what happens there, I think, is that the aggregation software I'm using uh, doesn't catch these and puts them through after I've already scrolled. So I'm gonna go back and, and answer a couple there. Becky had chimed in and maybe I'll get to yours there, uh, Connor. Uh, Becky, it would be great to have an ALAR transverse uh, treatment available at the Virginia Clinic in the UK. Yeah, not anytime soon, Becky. Um, this procedure is too complex 
requires too much in the way of equipment right now. For example, uh, you know, our clean, we have a clean room lab where our cells are processed. That alone is probably going to run $500,000. We have two different C arms set up now at endoscope. So those equipment costs quickly add up to a couple hundred thousand dollars more. So it's just not something that we could expect another clinic to take on to do this procedure. I mean, we're talking about a million dollars now in extra costs. So it's not something that's going to happen in the UK anytime soon. Uh, it may at some point in the future, but not anytime soon, because that's a huge investment for someone to make. Uh, plus, we've also got to have you know the right providers. We love those UK providers. I think they can do great work in doing those posterior injections. So I would definitely go there and get them to do that. Um, and then I think, yeah, so, so I think I've already kind of answered that one, answered that one. I'm just trying to see if Connor, yeah, Connor, I did answer your question before and, and it was kind of early there, but the, if you're, like I said, if you're, if your chin is down like this permanently, and you try to move it up and it goes right back down, um, then that might be uh, dystonia. Now, if what you're talking about um, is it, it kind of gets stuck when you look down and then you can get it unstuck, then that's a different thing. So I think I asked for a little bit more information about what was going on uh, when you look down uh, and did that chin tuck. Um, uh, let's see, uh, Becky, is there an ideal time frame for a second PRP procedure? Um, sure, you know, we're looking at uh, usually for PRP based procedures, four to six weeks is the interval if repetitive PRP procedures are required. Now I'm talking about in the spine. If you're talking about another thing, please, uh, please go ahead and let me know because, you know, I don't want to misspeak there or, or answer your question incorrectly. Uh, uh, Kyle Keeney, uh, I hope I'm saying that right. I, I don't know if I am. Uh, thank you for your videos. I've learned a lot. Uh, oh, I got to show these guys. Thank you for your videos. I've learned a lot. I'm currently one of uh, your patients and have had posterior treat one posterior treatment. More questions about the process. We'll save those for future appointments. Uh, sure. Thank you. You know, try to see if we can get these videos out once or twice a week to try to answer these questions as they come up. And that's one of the great things about being a doctor, right? You see patients all the time and, you know, you see where the deficits in education are. And so for me, my job is to try to fill those gaps. Uh, John, does increasing concentrations of dextrose and prolotherapy equate to more healing? Would 15% dextrose be less effective than 25? You know, John, probably not. Um, the standard prolo solution is somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. A few providers go higher than that. But based on how prolo works, um, I don't think it'll add a lot to uh, the the equation by going higher. Uh, Cien, uh, what's the success rate on this due to less symptoms compared to fusion surgery? Yeah, Cien, I, I can only tell you the patients I see back from fusion surgery. Uh, so what I see back from fusion surgery is the success rate, six out of 10, maybe somewhere in there. Um, I think, uh, and I think we're running about two and three. So I think the success rate is about the same. The biggest difference between this and fusion surgery is when things go wrong in fusion surgery, they go wrong in a big way. So for example, near as I can tell, the complication, the life-changing complication rate for fusion surgery is uh, one to two out of 10. Um, and when I mean life-changing fusion uh, complications, let me give you an example. So this is you know, many years ago, uh, really nice gal, she was a, uh, a Stanford student, extremely smart college uh, aged girl, uh, was treated uh, with a C1C2 screw fixation. And she woke up and the first thing she told me was when she nodded her head, she would hear ee, 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 ee. Um, So it didn't take long to figure out that the C1C2 screw had gone uh, 
inadvertently into the zero one joint. Now that's not a no harm, no foul thing, right? Once you put a screw into that joint and it's not recognized for weeks and she's allowed to, to move around, the joint's toast. Um, so that's a good example. When I say life-changing complications, there is no coming back from that one. Um, that joint is forever destroyed. Um, so that's the big difference, I think, between an interventional procedure, which is not perfect, but a, a surgical fusion procedure. Uh, it's just the nature of this shit happens is much, much bigger. Uh, Ricardo, is there any difference between bone marrow product and the jelly of umbilical cordon regarding results? Yeah, Ricardo, there's no data at all in the use of umbilical cord uh, in the cervical spine. Um, and here in the U.S., and I don't know if you're in the U.S. or not, um, the, uh, there are no products, uh, umbilical cord products that contain stem cells. That's the, the paper I have up right now that we published. Um, but I don't know of a single publication of the use of umbilical cord products in the neck at all. And uh, we obviously have publications now out for bone marrow, PRP, um, prolotherapy. All of those have publications in the peer-reviewed literature, but nothing I've ever seen uh, for, for umbilical cord. I already answered that one. Uh, Shante, how do you know lax, or how do you know if the transverse ligament is lax? Could I send you a new upper MRI for the assessment? We spoke to said Dr. Rosa MRI, but wanted to see a DMX. Um, yeah, again, I think the, the most sensitive way to diagnose this is a DMX. Um, and uh, as far as new upright MRIs, if you uh, want to do a, uh, a telemedicine evaluation, Carla would be the person to set that up with. And then obviously we can look at all of that and try to figure out uh, whether or not that, that second upright MRI shows anything different or shows anything else. Uh, Mark, uh, thanks for going into detail regarding the facet injection, especially with the clinic in Florida. I was a patient there and had six treatments that never actually injected my cervical facets. The video information you shared in it would be helpful in warning other patients they should avoid that clinic. Yeah, Mark, I would, you know, listen, I, I, I don't want to get into, yeah, I didn't name the clinic primarily because I don't want to get into that kind of thing with those guys. But you're right, they, they routinely tell, the clinic you're talking about will routinely tell a patient they're getting their cervical facets injected. The patient will come to us um, and they'll say, well, I already had all these facets injected. And, and we say, no, you didn't have any of them injected. Um, and then we have to repeat that. So the patient's paying a lot of money. They think they're getting these facets injected. Uh, there's nothing that was done at the clinic that would meet the definition of um, injecting those upper cervical facets. Um, and I've confirmed that on the phone with the clinic that they don't do that. Uh, but the patients are somehow believing that they do. So thanks for bringing it up. Um, but it's a big issue. Um, uh, Becky, uh, post first. I'm not sure what you mean by that, Becky. So maybe give me some more info. Um, uh, we need PIC on the UK. If you could be able soon, it's a long way to travel. Yeah, but no time soon. Uh, so we're probably looking at a number of years before that would be possible just because of the, the huge investment it requires uh, to do that kind of procedure. It's not the standard stuff, regrettably. Um, Becky, yes, referring to the C-spine shoulder. So yeah, Becky, there we're talking about, to answer your, your first question about PRP, there, we're really talking about four to six week follow up would be the appropriate time for that. Uh, so that's generally when when multiples are needed, uh, that time that we're looking to see whether another one is required. Uh, and in some patients where we know multiples are needed, we might schedule that person sort of every six weeks. Uh, Connor, uh, uh, it's like my head is in a chin tuck in a neutral position kind of like my C when her skull is lifted. Oh yeah, so so Connor, I think the thing to measure on you, and I'm not sure if they already have, would be a clavoaxial angle. So that's the amount that the head is tilted forward. So if it feels like that's how your head is, then that's the posterior ligaments back here. Uh, so that might be 
nuchal ligament, uh, vertebral dural ligament, supraspinous, interspinous ligaments, but not as much down there. Uh, the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane back here, uh, atlanto-occipital ligaments, all of the stuff that holds things up from back here. But you would want to, uh, in an upright setting, ideally, uh, get uh, an MRI, or if you have that kind of MRI, have someone measure the CXA, or clivoaxial angle, and see if that's abnormal, or in this case, abnormally low. Uh, but that's the next thing I think you should probably get done, is get that measured. Uh, Connor, on my MRI, my atlas looks like there's a huge gap posterior between C1 and C2. The spinous processes of C1 is lifted towards skull. Yeah, so that's what we're talking about. I think that's a good one to, to get measured, is that clivoaxial angle. Also, on a DMX, because it's a live x-ray, you can see that stuff moving around and really get a sense of if it is, you know, sort of opening up too much and your skull is kind of falling forward like this. Happy to help, Shanze. Uh, Connor, it's not dystonia, but rather position of my skull is sitting. Yeah, I get it now, uh, for sure. Uh, are you going, Chris, are you going to train Dr. Kirkor in the UK? Uh, Regenix, please need help. So this cannot fly. Yeah, Chris, not for uh, PICL anytime soon. Uh, what I would recommend is those guys can certainly do posterior cervical stuff. And I do trust them to do upper cervical facets. So I, I would go there and certainly get that done. Um, but for PICL, as I've talked about, the financial investment is just huge uh, to ask a clinic uh, to make. And uh, we also want to get some research published on this thing uh, before we ever go there, because my biggest concern with PICL is trying to keep it available. And uh, that's a very difficult needle to thread is to get a new procedure um, from experimental into uh, in the mix of the standard of care. And that takes a long time. And frank, frankly, I'll probably spend the rest of my existing career, and obviously I'm not a young spring chicken anymore, uh, getting to that point. Uh, because if we don't do that, it's very easy for procedures to blow up. And they blow up simply when doctors try to move them out into the field too quickly before it's completely dialed in and everything is known. And then some bad things happen. And next thing you know, the procedure just disappears into the dustbin of history. So I really don't want that to happen here. Connor, almost like I want to clap my skull. Yeah, I got you. Um, got that one already. Can I send you an old MRI on my neck, please, from two years ago? Yes, yeah, the best thing to do would be to uh, book a telemedicine visit with Carla. Um, I think I put her stuff down last time, but I'm going to put her email address down here. So I'm putting uh, her email address into the comments, uh, caseallis at centenaschultz.com, uh, so that you can reach out to her and try to get something scheduled. Um, let's see, uh, Goldie, uh, I was told I have cervical dystonia uh, by one neuro. The other neuro said no. It's your cervical neck ligaments. Yeah, uh, Goldie, I, I can tell you that uh, the prevailing theory behind cervical dystonia right now is actually that it's due to upper cervical instability, uh, which I found surprising. That's a shift, meaning 10 years ago, uh, it, it was not that way. Uh, I think it was just a big question mark as to what caused it. It was something in the brain. Someone, you know, some people had some theories, but they weren't sure. And now that's, that's changed. So I think your second neuro probably sounds more accurate. Obviously, I don't know your your clinical scenario, but just in general. Uh, sure, happy to help. Uh, Connor, uh, sorry about so many messages. It's like, it's looking like I need to see Kirker in London and then PSO procedure address laxity. Yeah, Connor, I think seeing those guys in London, Dr. Kirkor and the Algo Cells guys would be great because uh, realize that we're talking about the ligaments back here. If your head, is doing this, 
And those are the ligaments that they can reach and, and treat quite expertly. So that's where I would start because the type of problem you're describing may be due to a lax transverse, or it may be due to just you know, problems in the ligaments back here. The transverse obviously would be PICL, but the ligaments back here can be hit by Dr. Kirkor et al. at Algo cells. Um, uh, John, I skipped your session. Yeah, I apologize, or your question, John. These, these things kind of come in, uh, regrettably, not in order sometimes, so I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, I did answer this one, John. Uh, so increasing uh, concentrations of dextrose and prolotherapy are unlikely uh, beyond uh, 10 or 15 percent to make a big difference in clinical outcome. Uh, let's see here. Let me sure I get back to where I was. I'll go sell Dr. Kirkor is very good. I have PRP post to their 40% improvement after seven weeks already. Great, Phil. Yeah, I think they're those are excellent guys. You know, one of the things that impressed me about them the most is we have, uh, you guys may or may not know, I'm, I'm the founder of and, and chief medical officer for Regenix. We have about 75 sites around the U US and we've got six international sites. And what was amazing to me about the AlgoCell guys is that we've got, you know, we have docs that are two states away and, you know, bitch and moan about having to come in for training. Um, and those guys are in London and they were here uh, uh, at least eight or nine times uh, soaking up every little bit of information they could about doing this stuff. So it was really an amazing commitment, if you think about that, to, you know, to fly here for a couple days from London uh, more than a half dozen times. Um, it was just an amazing thing to see. So uh, very good providers out there. Uh, Becky, have you seen many patients with type 3 posterior atlantic simple dislocation? Do they usually have very severe symptoms? Um, any non-surgical methods for a tethered cord release? Um, so let's an answer the second one first. Uh, Becky, let's go to, and I, and I, do I think have a hard stop in about five minutes, guys? So I'm going to have to uh, have to move on after that. Um, but uh, let's go to tethered cord here, Becky. I really want you to read this blog, um, and this will be available. Obviously, um, let's see if I can make sure. So this is the one. So if you go to the regenix.com blog, two X's, and you type in just tethered cord, it'll come up. But I want you to read that because uh, with regard to tethered cord, uh, I think this procedure is being way, way, way overdone and is an incredibly invasive procedure. There are certainly patients out there that might need it, but it's a no going back procedure. So once you release uh, the cord, there's no going back. So Definitely something you should read. Um, as far as type three uh, posterior lenticipal dislocation, I need to look at the images uh, in order to give you any sense. So that would be contacting Carla. Uh, Goldie, can in, also can compressions lumbar area sacrum cause blood flow issues to the legs? Yeah, Goldie, that's not so much compression as it is irritation of the, the spinal nerves and autonomics. So we see that all the time in patients with lower lumbar radiculopathy or pissed off nerves in their low back. Uh, what ligaments are they going into in the clinic in London? I think we just went into that. Uh, so uh, again, uh, they're gonna do the posterior ligaments and uh, they're gonna be able to do those upper cervical facets. So that's gonna be the uh, the midline cervical ligaments and those upper cervical facet joints. Um, uh, Goldie, can trilateral cyst and lumbar sacral area be a reason not to do treatments PRP? No, we see lots of patients with trilateral cysts. Uh, not a big deal. You do need to know they're there for sure to avoid them. Uh, but if you know they're there, it, it's not an issue. Uh, Becky. 
We are thought of joining up with the chiropractor and sharing premises with them so patients get DMX and PICL. So, yeah, that's not going to happen, Becky. <laughs> We'd never do this in a chiropractic office. Not, not ever going to happen on that one. Um, again, we're, that's like saying doing open heart surgery in a chiropractic office. It's not safe. That's not the right place to do something like this. Um, we've got a specialized procedure suite, crash carts, um, intubation supplies, uh, a million dollar lab, endoscopy, dual fluoroscopy. There's just, that's not going to happen. Uh, Phil, uh, at CN Lewis, use, I believe, super smart. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, uh, Bura Gate, I apologize. Uh, Took me a second there. Uh, why can't the mouth be fully or open fully because something doesn't let and compress the roof of the mouth as it compresses everything behind the throat to abdomen? Can it be due to skull sinking? Um, yeah, so I'm not quite sure what you're asking. If you're asking why someone might have a hard time opening their mouth with CCI, um, frequently, CCI patients will get involvement of the TMJ, and then that will decrease mouth opening. Uh, as far as cranial settling, uh, that's a harder one uh, to answer because uh, the only way to see if cranial settling is causing your symptoms is either to do invasive traction, uh, which is where we take screws and put that into the skull and perform traction and see if your symptoms go away, uh, but ultimately, we're really not going to know until someone carves a hole in the back of your skull and does a fusion to see if your symptoms go away. So that's the hard part about that diagnosis. Okay, guys, uh, looks like questions are slowing down. Uh, thank you so much for watching today. I do have a hard stop. I've got to get to a meeting um, and uh, really appreciate all your time today. If there's other questions I didn't get to, hopefully uh, our social media person can copy those over to next time. If not, Join us on Monday and we will be here uh, in order to, uh, to answer some more questions. Also have another topic to, to discuss. So thanks so much for watching and, and have a great weekend, everyone. Appreciate your, your time today.